All right. Uh, first and foremost, welcome to IIIF week and especially the introduction to IIIF session that we're doing today. Just a couple of housekeeping kind of bits and bobs for everybody. We will be recording this and we'll be emailing links to the recording about a week afterwards. So just keep that in mind. If you haven't yet, please join us on Slack. There's a link to the Slack channel if you aren't already a member of IIIF Slack in the chat. And once you're there, just join the hashtag IIIF-week channel where you'll have an opportunity to ask questions or continue asking questions as well after the session is finished. Because of our large number of attendees, we've disabled uh, the video and muted you all for the duration of this call. But if you do have questions, we really encourage you to ask them and please use the Q&A function uh, that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I guess without further ado, let's jump right in. Um, so I'd like to introduce our host for today's session is Glenn Robson. He's the technical coordinator for IIIF and will be giving your introduction to IIIF. And at the very end of the day, we'll have two presenters who will be moderating your questions and holding a bit of a discussion with Glenn. They are Julian, he's an active IIIF participant from Switzerland, has been a lead on the TITS project that is happening there. And we have also Andrea, he is head of digital development in Serbia at the library Milutin Bojic. Um, again, we've disabled questions in the chat, but please do ask them in the Q&A forum. So I think with that, uh, Glenn, it's over to you. Okay, thanks, Anne. Just share my screen. Do you see my slides okay? Great. Yeah, Glenn. So welcome everyone to the IIIF week. Um, as you probably know, this is a week of events. Um, started off yesterday uh, and continues through the week. Um, this is a, a basic introduction to IIIF. Uh, and I'll be talking um, for about um, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, uh, and there'll be time for questions after. Um, so I'm Glenn Robson. I'm the IIIF technical coordinator. I've been working for IIIF um, for almost three years now. Uh, and my ro role as the uh, technical coordinator is to assist people um, with implementing IIIF. Um, so after this um, presentation, if you do have questions, uh, do feel free to, to reach out if you've got any uh, specific uh, issues you'd like me to look at. And I'm gonna start with um, what is IIIF? So IIIF stands for the International Image Interoperability Framework, uh, which is a real mou mouthful. Um, so many people just call it uh, IIIF. Uh, that's the shorthand for it. Um, and I'll go through uh, the different reasons why this um, acronym uh, stands out. But basically, IIIF is a, um, it's a model for presenting and annotating content such as image and audio files. Um, so IIIF supports images, but also supports audiovisual files uh, with lots of benefits. Uh, and so it's the specification, this API, but it's also a global community that develops the open API. So it's a community as well as the uh, API, which allows images to work. And there are hundreds of institutions around the world using IIIF. Um, there's a link there to the IIIF map. Uh, and if you notice your institution isn't listed on that map, um, please do add it. Um, it's difficult to know how many people are using IIIF. Um, and this is one of the ways that we're trying to gather it. But it is a global community uh, of people implementing IIIF, particularly in Europe, uh, the US, Japan, uh, and other areas. Um, there's a large list of implementations and this is just a small subset, um, but you can see there's um, some large museums, galleries, universities, state and national libraries. Um, there's content aggregators like the British Museum, uh, the Europeana content, uh, DPLA and other institutions in the Wikipedia Foundation. Uh, there's large research institutions like um, Oxford, Cambridge, um, Stanford, Harvard, and lots of other places. Uh, and then state national libraries, um, so National Library of uh, New Zealand, Scotland, Wales, British Library, uh, and lots of different national institutions have implemented IIIF. And this is only a short subset uh, of the total IIIF um, institution, institutions that are using IIIF. But if I start with why do we need IIIF? 
So digital images are fundamental carriers of information across the fields of cultural heritage, STEM and others. They help us understand complex process through visualization. They grab our attention, help us quickly understand abstract concept, concepts. They help document the past and the present and preserve the future. They're also ubiquitous. We interact with thousands of them every day in both real life and on the web. In short, images are important. We interact with large volumes of them online. And there are lots of different types of images that are made available through AAAF. So there's lots of digitization, so historical documents like newspapers. There's also um, scientific imaging, um, natural history uh, imaging, and all different variety of content um, that can be displayed as images are uh, made available through AAAF. But sharing images on the web has historically been complicated and much work is needed um, to effectively share and work with them. The infrastructure can be hard and expensive to develop and maintain. And the image delivery can be slow and there is overall a disjointed experience for end users who have to work across interfaces to discover and use the items they need. Even the images are made openly, uh, if the images are made openly available to all, we often find that they still live in silos because of these challenges. Here's one example. The repositories and the applications providing access to digital medieval manuscript in today's environment are heavily siloed, with access to each repository provided through one-off applications. This is a microcosm of the wider world of access to image-based scholarly resources, and many sites are siloed with no way to work with content that is distributed across them. Many apps are one-offs with the overhead to code and maintain posing a significant burden and users are forced to cope with all this, learning to work across many different UIs with little integration. But IIIF provides a solution to these shared problems through its APIs, its growing suite of compatible software and the efforts of a community of adopters. So first, starting with a common need, the ability to make large image files for users to view as a whole and then zoom in on the details quickly and easily. This example on the slide is for a Japanese tax map created in 1837. It's meant to be read in the round by somebody standing in the middle. You can scale, um, you can see the scale when this GIF zooms out and for reference, the map is 11 by 17 feet and the person standing next to it, Wayne, who works in the library at Stanford is six feet, four inches tall. This image is a composite of 158 individual images without measuring a total of 34,000 by 22,000 pixels and the file size is about 1.27 gigabytes. Without IIIF, an end user might have to download an extremely large file to view, but with it, there is a smooth and easy viewing experience. So in a technical sense, IIIF solves the problem of how to make this huge file available, but also allows an end user to view the entirety of the map in high resolution, then zoom and rotate it into different tax zones, as if, just as if they were standing in the middle and looking out at different areas, then leaning in to read the details, providing them a digital version of the experience. The viewer sh um, should have standing in the middle of the map, when we, of course, will not be allowed to do this if this is a, um, a physical map. And from the beginning of IIIF, um, there was an idea of enabling research. And the idea of um, doing this has been baked into IIIF since its cre creation. One extremely common method of working with images is comparison which IIIF enables. This particular example is a letter written by Alexander Hamilton from the collection of the Library of Congress, comparing a regular scan of the letter with a multispectral version to highlight the underlying text that had been scratched out or overwritten. And this is another example of um, a possibility in IIIF, is re reunifying uh, disparate digital objects. So this particular manuscript uh, was originally owned by an infamous bibliocast, Otto Edge, uh, in, the t uh, in its 12th century French gloss Bible, um, and he owned it in the first half of the 20th century. During the 1940s and 1950s, this manuscript was broken apart and individual leaves were sold throughout North America and were purchased by public and academic libraries. At the time of this reconstruction, reconstruction 33 institutions holding leaves from this gloss Bible have been identified and each institution made their images available over IIIF. These have been collected by um, somebody called Ben Alberton of Stanford into a single manifest uh, and using the IIIF viewers it can be viewed as a single digital object even though the original digital objects are distributed across North America. 
And with IFFF, and this is another example um, where instead of the whole manuscript being uh, distributed, the manuscript itself is in uh, the BNF in Paris, um, but the illustrations were cut out and they're owned by a separate institution uh, on the other side of Paris. And both these institutions have made these um, two different images available and it's possible to overlay the image onto the manuscript. And you can see they're physically distributed on the other side of Paris. And using this, uh, you can see that the little thumbnails of the illustrations are overloaded onto the manuscript. And it's possible to zoom into both images. Another use case for um, IIIF images uh, is to georeference them. So this is an example from uh, the National Library of Scotland. Uh, where the historical map has been overlaid onto the modern map. And there's a tool from Clocan called GeoReferencer, which will take a link to a IIIF image and allow you to put points on a modern map and the old map, and it will warp the old map so it can be overlaid onto the modern map. Um, and this is available for IIIF images. IIIF also has the capability that allows you to work with annotations or transcriptions like OCR and then search within that text. So this can be thought of as a PDF search within. Uh, and this is an example from the Wellcome Library. Annotation is a core component of IIIF and it can be used in many different ways. This particular example is from edX course at Harvest, which is a remote learning course and uses an extremely high resolution image of a cell and allows students to zoom in and view the different parts of the cell as annotations. And annotations can unlock all sorts of other capabilities. This is an example from the National Library of Wales in Digerati, who developed a IIIF based crowdsourcing application. The first project was to tag and locate a collection of photographs and the crowdsourcing solution was taken to the local community, men who, many who knew the individuals in the photographs. This is another um, great example um, of the indigenous digital archive based in North America, uh, where a group of native Indians have um, taken their collections from the National Archives of America uh, and created a website where they can view the different um, information about um, some of the schools um, and other information. And this, the annotations have been developed um, automatically. And so all of the data has been OCR'd uh, and all of the entities have been picked out um, and it's really quite an amazing resource. Another use of annotations is this, this example from a company called COGAP, who do a lot of work with museums in the IIIF community. It's called Stories, with three eyes, of course, and it provides a guided view through IIIF annotations on a page, allowing one to view fine details with associated information, and then also allow the user to break away and zoom and pan on their own to get an understanding of the item. And here's another similar example, again from Digerati. It's a tool called Canvas Panel, um, showing the many levels and areas of an ocean liner from the Victorian Albert Museum. So this is a tool used by museums to create supplementary online resources in support of their exhibitions, but IIIF can also be used in galleries to enrich an exhibition and provide a level in of interactivity for the audience. Here we have a physical manuscript on display open to a single page. Curious viewers can use the iPad on the wall behind it to view other pages of the manuscript that include scholarly annotations added by the exhibition curators. And one of the strengths of IIIS is you can make all of the rich digital images available in a choice of viewers. Also users can take your content and view it in their viewer of choice. And this is an example of the same content available in the uh, universal viewer on the top left, um, Tiffy, uh, Mirador 2 and Mirador 3. And all of this can be support audiovisual material. This is a prototype of what can be done with version three of the API. Um, so I'm going to play the video. Unfortunately, you won't be able to hear the sound, um, but you'll be able to see what's going on. So in this IIIF version three um, implementation, you've got the video on the left hand side and you have the score on the right hand side and you can see the score is played in time with the video.
So now that we know what Triple Life can do, let's take a high level look at how it works through its APIs or application programming interface. APIs function as a sort of an agreement between two parts of a system or different systems that data will cons consistently go in one way and out another way, allowing you to switch out different pieces, like swapping out a front end or a back end or both. The shared contract um, at an institution level allows you to simplify your, your stack and use off the shelf tools developed by others. These include shared viewers, crowdsourcing systems, and the map georeferencing examples I showed you earlier. But the full power of IIIF really comes into effect across institutions who have adopted it, where the normalization brought by the IIIF APIs allow them to be worked with across repositories in many ways. Searching across repositories, seeing another institution's annotations, or opening an institution's images in a separate IIIF compliant app, for example. This gives the power to make users um, make their own cross institution collections of digital material. And it gives you the power to use many of the IIIF uh, open source and commercial software solutions. Um, this is not a complete list again, but there are uh, imaging servers here, annotation servers, crowdsource solutions, uh, and many, many other possibilities. And this is all done by two core IIIF APIs, one that delivers pixels and the other delivers the presentation of the object. The image delivery API delivers the pixels. And what this slide is showing is that just a URL that delivers a whole image or parts image in a different resolutions. So you can see uh, the image API can be used to um, select regions of image, select a size, rotate it, and select quality and, and also the format. And here you can see a detail of this happening in the URL. URL. Everything up to the ABCD1234 part of the URL is considered the image identifier and everything after this falls into the spec of the image API. In this example, we can see the full image on the left hand side. We first select the region, uh, 80 pixels from the left, 15 pixels from the top, and 60 pixels wide and 75 pixels high. We then say we want to 80% of the original size and then rotate it by 345 degrees. We've asked for a quality of a grayscale and we've also asked for a format of a JPEG. The image API works great for a single image, but the presentation API works by adding context and structure to IIIF images. It allows you to create a presentation of your digital object that a viewer will understand. And if you have a look at this example, which is Mirador 3, um, you can see everything in blue is the IIIF uh, image API, so the main image in the front. Um, the thumbnails at the bottom are also using IIIF image API URLs, um, but the presentation API controls the order um, and also all of the metadata and the description of the element of the digital object. So the presentation API allows you to work with multiple images and also gives enough information for the user to be able to know what they're looking at. Whereas the image API is all about the pixels, all about the zooming of the IIIF image. And use of these tools can go, go beyond dedicated IIIF image viewers. It can also be good for general web development, web development. In this example from the Art Institute in Chicago, their mobile app uses custom IIIF image URLs for thumbnails representing different tour options or views of works on the map um, to view the tour that's driven by IIIF. And they actually have a simple tool that uses the image API for staff to use to crop images for a variety of uses. The cropping tool produces a reusable IIIF image URL. I should add the two other um, IIIF APIs one for search, which I showed earlier, and one for authentication. The search API allows for searching within the text of an object, like a PDF search box. And this can be used to search transcriptions like OCR, but also for crowd searching, crowdsourcing annotations. The, attend, the authentication API allows uh, materials to be restricted, for example, to a subset of users, or if you need to agree a license before viewing the item. So looking to the future, um, the main areas that uh, IIIF are looking at, and although we have a, a road mapping se session on Thursday, which you're welcome to join to inform the future progress, but the main priorities at the moment are looking at research on um, resource discovery, particularly how do we find our IIIF images. 
Uh, and the second one is looking at maps and georeferencing. Uh, there's a new group started uh, recently looking at how we can georeference uh, IIIF resources. So you saw that example where um, we were crowdsourcing photographs. How do you place that image on a map? Uh, and the second item is standardizing, looking at how we georeference uh, maps, as you saw in that previous application. So first on discovery, there are two specifications that have been released recently. Uh, one is the Change Discovery API, which is really looking at providing tools and uh, standards for aggregators to be able to harvest IIIF resources. So this is the, looking at uh, Europeana and other ag aggregators uh, being able to harvest IIIF content to create these large discovery solutions. And then the Content State, State API, which is about taking the content from one viewer and moving it to another viewer. An example of this is you might have two images, uh, two manifests, open in Mirador and doing side-by-side -side comparison. And you want to take that and send that to a colleague. And the Content State API gives you a, a way of transferring that information from one viewer to another. And there is also a new Discovery for Humans community group, uh, which is complementing this work, which is looking more at the UX of discovery. How do people find IIIF results? So at a practical level, um, how do you start with IIIF? Uh, and there are some recommendations. If you go to the IIIF.io slash technical details, um, there are much more details on how to get started. Uh, but to summarize, um, the advice is to start with the image API. Uh, and for this, there are many open source uh, image API solutions. And if you follow that link to the awesome IIIF, you'll see um, a variety which you're available to download. Um, so you choose your image API, you set that up and you put your images into your image API and then you investigate the presentation API, which is mainly mapping your existing metadata to IIIF. And this tends to be more of a custom um, institution by institution type mapping because everyone's metadata um, appears to be different. Um, so this is much more customized step. But you generate this presentation manifest and make them available along with your image API and then you can start using the IIIF viewers um, and start publishing content. After that, you might want to look at the IIIF search API, particularly if you've got OCR transcriptions or if you've got annotations from crowdsourcing. Uh, the search API allows you to uh, present that. And there are a number of tools um, available to implement the search API. And they're also available on that awesome IIIF list. And then finally, authentication. Um, not a huge amount of institutions have looked at authentication. There are a few uh, like Stanford and the British Library and others who have implemented IIIF authentication on their material and the Wellcome Trust is another good example. Um, but most people concentrate on their open, open access images, although you can make um, more closed access images available through IIIF. And then finally, if you want more information, um, please do join the community. Um, so we have a IIIF email list, um, which uh, you're welcome to, uh, to assign to join. We also have a new newsletter, which is sent quarterly, which is the latest developments uh, in IIIF. Uh, we mentioned the Slack, which the link should be in the uh, chat, uh, but join that. There's a beginner's channel if you want to ask uh, questions to a smaller group of people, um, asking specific um, information about implementing IIIF. Uh, there's also the IIIF Week channel, which we mentioned earlier, just for this conference. Uh, we host fortnightly uh, telephone calls. So every two weeks, um, there is a demonstration of um, the latest developments of IIIF and different organizations uh, presenting what they're doing. Uh, join a IIIF interest group. So we have a number of um, interest groups. We have uh, museums, uh, manuscripts, maps, newspaper, uh, archives, 3D. Uh, and they all have regular telephone calls. Um, if you go to the IIIF website, you'll be able to see when they meet uh, and they're all open uh, for everybody to join. Uh, and then expose your collections via IIIF. Um, so this is the real main reason for IIIF is to, to get people working together and get people exporting their collections uh, via IIIF so that academics and others can use them. And then finally, consider joining the IIIF consortium, uh, which supports putting together events like this uh, and also supports uh, training and the development of the IIIF standard. So in summary, IIIF is growing very quickly with hundreds of adopters and over a billion IIIF compliant images available. 
The future is looking bright and we'll hope you'll join the community as IIIF moves forward into the next stage, stages. And stay in touch and I'll stop there for questions. All right, thank you very much, Glenn, for that presentation. Uh, as I said before, the Q&A forum is up and running. So please just give us your questions and uh, Julian and Andrea will be uh, forwarding them to Glenn. Hi, so we, I think we answered most of the questions in the chat. Uh, just one person asked if we could put the last slides up again. So Glenn, could you share your screen and just have this last slide up? Which one was it, was it? Um... Uh, maybe we just, I don't know if that's just stay in touch. The get involved one. Yes. I'll also put this one up. So I can see one question. Um, what are the scenarios for implementing IIIF at a smaller museum? Um, so this is a really good question. So there are lots of different ways of um, implementing IIIF. Um, I mentioned here, um, choosing an image API server. Um, so that's one way of doing it, is choosing one of the free open source um, IIIF image API servers uh, and installing it in your institution. But many institutions um, don't have the resources or uh, the capabilities to be able to install it themselves. Um, so there are other options. There are IIIF hosting services. Um, so IIIFhosting.com um, is um, developed by Clocan, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and they offer um, hosting of IIIF images. Um, for museums in particular, um, we're seeing really good uptake actually in um, museum uh, dam systems supporting IIIF. Uh, and this is probably the simplest way for um, smaller museums. Um, to get your existing dams or um, digital content provider to support IIIF. Um, so that's probably the easiest way to do it if you can get them to support. Examples include um, ContentDM, uh, Next, um, and there are quite a few different museum vendors that support IIIF. Uh, that's probably the easiest solution. Um, can you explain a little more about how the authentication API works? Uh, so let me find a presentation that I have. So this is a, an older presentation, um, close to when the authentication um, API went live. Um, what it provides is, is um, these kind of use cases. So I have an existing authentication service. Um, so the service is already being, the authentication service is already live in the institution. Uh, you might want to offer tiered access. So free access to a low quality image, but maybe paid access to a high quality uh, access. Uh, you might want to um, provide open access in the building, but log in outside. And you might want to provide single sign-on. Um, another option is you might want to use to agree to terms and conditions. Uh, an example for this is the Welcome Trust, which uses um, for modern archival records. Um, you have to agree that um, you respect the 
the laws involved in um, personal data before you can view the content. Um, and so there are these four interaction patterns. Uh, login, which a user is required to log in before they can view their content. Click through, which is this um, idea of agreeing to some sort of license before you're able to view the content. Uh, kiosk, and this is for kind of an internal only access um, where you're only allowed in providing access inside the building, but outside the building, uh, you will be allowed to the kiosk because this kind of special permission to access uh, the resources. And then external where all of the authentication and managing happens outside of the, the AAAS spec, uh, but you can point a link to it. Um, there's a relatively complicated um, method of, of doing the auth and um, I definitely point you to the AAAF auth specification uh, to get more detail. Um, but there's kind of a flow defined in the specification uh, for you be able to kind of handle the authentication. The question about um, could you speak a little more, bit more about how AAAF can be used for video resources? Do we also have a presentation for this? So the way AAAF works uh, technically is you have these concept of canvases, which is kind of the digital page um, that supports the AAAF image. Uh, and the example I showed from uh, the BNF and Vilblissima, um, the canvas, the whole image of the manuscript is painted onto the canvas. And then the inset is painted on top of the image. And that's the way that you have these um, two images which are put together um, and the little image is, is placed on the canvas. Uh, and this is the same uh, for audiovisual data. So this canvas in this example has a width and a height and also a duration. And you're able to then paint things onto this canvas. Um, so this example, um, you point the image of the tractor and the fire uh, on the whole canvas uh, for the full duration. So that will always be there. Uh, this, and then you put this video and you're placing it in that box from uh, seconds four to seven uh, at this particular um, place in the canvas. And this example, um, can be played here as well. So I, I don't think you'll be able to hear the sound again. Um, but as this is a single canvas and the original image is painted on the whole canvas, we've got some text that comes in at a certain time period. We've got other images that come in. And there's also this video uh, which comes in as painted. Um, and if it loaded, it would start playing uh, as, I was, as the conversation was going. So question, um, could you say a bit more about the annotation function? Um, I've also got a presentation for this.
so annotations uh, have take many different forms. Um, that any way of um, linking content to a canvas. Uh, so in the previous example where I showed um, this painting of the image onto the canvas, um, that was a way of doing annotations. This image is annotated onto the canvas. And then this image, image is also annotated onto this canvas. Uh, and annotations work in exactly the same way. Um, so this is an example of a newspaper page where the image is annotated onto the canvas. Uh, and then the annotations are also painted onto the same canvas. Um, so I don't know if you can see this. Um, so this on the right hand side uh, is an example of an an annotation list, which is a list of the OCR annotations. Um, you can see that the um, on part of the annotation points to the canvas and has an X, Y width height, which is the location of the box of the text. And then the chars of the annotation uh, in the top one, it says two. And it's basically saying that this annotation too is located this portion of the canvas uh, and everything is painted onto the canvas. So a question from an educational schools um, standpoint, does this link into Google Suites for Education and its plugins and other LMS platforms? Um, I don't know about Google Suites. I haven't seen um, Google Suites for Education. Um, I don't know about LMS systems. There are some kind of distance learning uh, MOOC systems which IFFF uh, integrates in. Uh, specifically, the, the Harvard example, edX, um, is a long distance uh, learning platform and they've done customization to include IIIF. I don't know about Google Suites. So a question, um, would you link PIDs to images or the manifests? Um, so I know Julian probably has many views on this, <laughs> um, but persistent identifiers. Um, so the way that IIIF works, uh, so this is an example of a manifest. Um, so this is kind of the unit of the presentation API, the thing that's passed around between different viewers. Um, so manifest is this JSON metadata, and this is defined by the presentation API. Uh, and what this has is an ID, and this is the ID from the manifest. So if you put that into a browser, you should get to this manifest. Um, so in IIIF, it can always be thought that this um, persistent identifier for this manifest is this long URL here. And how this URL is made up is not specified by the IIIF standard. Um, so in this example from the National Library of Wales, their persistent identifier is 4642022. That's their long-term persistent identifier. Um, so it's kind of in the URL, um, but it's IIIF doesn't really have an opinion on how you structure your URLs. Um, and in this example, um, there is one persistent identifier for the manifest, which is a, um, a manuscript, the Welsh Book of Remembrance, uh, and then a PID for each particular image um, that is in the manifest. So everything has its own persistent identifiers. Um, there's also um, a handle for this. Um, so hdl.handle.net slash 10107, which is the National Library of Wales unique handle registration number. And then 46420022 will always get you to the, the triple I, the digital representation of this object. Um, question about costs. Um, so there are a variety of ways of doing IIIF, um, depending on how much, um, how many users you want to support. Um, if you want to have one look at, get kind of a handle of costs, um, you could have a look at the IIIF hosting, um, which is one option. Um, it's potentially more expensive than if you did it yourself, but you've got to compare and contrast it to the staff time involved in, in implementing. Uh, as I mentioned, um, implementing the IIIF image API is either um, choosing one of the off-the-shelf open source solutions, which doesn't cost anything to install, 
but doesn't cost uh, money to host, to run uh, and to support. Um, there are also something called um, a level zero IIIF image implementation. Uh, and this doesn't require a server. Uh, and this can be stored on um, storage that is available um, over the web, so HTTP available storage. And this is potentially very cheap. Um, so you can have a look at um, S3 uh, and the cost for putting this stuff online is, is very reasonable. Um, if you're gonna look at IIIF image servers, um, it provides a better service, but it does uh, cost more. Um, but if you want some ideas of the cost, um, you're welcome to reach out to me and I can give you some ideas. So how do you do annotation by, by crowdsourcing? Um, So because uh, annotation, because IIIF is a standard which gives you access to the uh, images and the manifests, um, you're able to create tools on top of that, uh, which can be reused with lots of people's collections. And one of the growths we've seen in IIIF is the development of um, crowdsourcing solutions. Uh, so I mentioned um, the National Library of Wales example. but there are many other IIIF crowdsourcing applications. Um, there's Record Gito, which is focused on uh, academic use cases and transcription. Um, this is free to use, uh, and you can just upload your, you can link your IIIF images, uh, and you can create a username. Um, and it allows you to kind of import your IIIF images and then annotate uh, a line in the text and link it to a place, a person, or event. Um, and then it will show up on a map. Uh, from the page is another crowdsourcing solution, um, which is particularly great for transcribing uh, text uh, and linking in between text, but it also can be used to create um, records. This is an example, um, I think from Texas, which is uh, transcribing uh, World War I records, uh, and they created a customized interface um, to allow people to transcribe it. Um, then I mentioned the Indigenous Digital Archive. Um, this is part crowdsourcing and part automatically generated uh, data. Um, so they, the kind of the more um, printed text they're able to OCR, um, but it does require correct correction, which they do with the community. Uh, and there's also the British Libraries in the Spotlight um, tool, uh, and that's another uh, libcrowds, I think is what it's called. Uh, and that's another open source uh, crowdsourcing solution. So the next question is, um, what are the commercial alternatives for sharing co cultural content with users? Um, I'm not sure how to answer this one. So there are commercial ways to use IIIF. Um, as I mentioned, through the, either IIIF hosting or through uh, commercial dams. Um, there are commercial aggregators. Um, I couldn't tell you if they were using IIIF. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't be much more help on that one. I exhausted all of the questions. All right. Well, as there are no more questions, um, I suppose the only thing last, left is to thank you all for coming. And um, if you have 
how we say any questions that pop up later during the day or if you ever have any questions a really good place to well air those questions is on the IIIF slack forum it tends to be pretty active and people will tend to get back to you pretty quickly um, as well as you know attend some of the other events this week i know i myself am going to a few as are probably the other people on this call um, and if you do have any questions, I mean, please do feel free to reach out to any or all of us, either directly on Slack or via other contact information. All right. Um, thank you, Lynn. And thank you, Julian and Andrea, for moderating our question session. And um, I wish you all a very good morning. Have a nice day. Bye. Thanks all. So I think with the um, we've been asked to save the links in the chat. Yeah, I've just um, I think Meg gets a copy of the um, Q and A. We could also just share. I mean, you have shown more than the the presentation itself, but the um, Maybe the link to the Google Drive where the PDF is is uh, the presentation as well, which is just done. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. I, I'll have to put them somewhere. I think <laughs> but yes, most yeah. of the links are already in it. Yeah, true. Okay, I'll do that. Well, thank you all. Thanks. It went well. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Have a great I think you might be muted on if you're speaking. Unmute. You're still muted. <laughs> Doing well. Okay. <laughs> um, we've had a woman who's asked for basically an invite to IIIF Slack. She's having some difficulty joining. I've sent her an invite, but it says it needs to be approved by an admin. Do you count as an admin? Oh, I do. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> there, hopefully it's approved now. Indeed. Yep, that's it. Brilliant. All right, excellent. I'll write back to her then, because um, I just gave her my email on the questions. Um, Thank you for that. She has one. No worries. All right. Well, have a good morning, Glenn. And yes. I'll see you at one of these thingies later on. Yeah, I'll see you later. Cheers. Bye.